Afternoon, welcome and thanks for coming. You know, one of the great joys of this institution we inhabit is that we do all have the chance on a fairly frequent basis to hear from some of the most enlightening and, and significant figures across the spectrum of academic and uh, journalistic, scientific and, and public life. And uh, it's especially, I think, exciting when leaders of our national government share time with us. We, just in the last several months, we've had uh, Secretary of the Navy Mavis was here, Secretary of Agriculture Bill, Bill uh, Sack was here. Um, but I've not been uh, any more excited than I am today to introduce uh, the Secretary of, U.S. Secretary of Education, uh, genuinely one of the great public servants of our day. Please uh, join me in welcoming Secretary Arnie Duncan. So by your leave, I'll, uh, I, the Secretary and I are, will we'll, uh, do a little duet for a short while, but you might be composing those of you who are interested questions, and in yeah, 20 minutes or, or so, we have microphones on either side, and as you summon the nerve, we'll invite you to step up to them, we'll, get to, we'll let you drive the discussion. Uh, Mr. Secretary, I think the first question, and in some ways the central question, uh, in, uh, I know for you and in your uh, assignment is, how are the nation's children doing? <laughs> uh, first of all, I'm thrilled to be here. It's actually my first time coming to Purdue, and I'm a huge fan of your president. He and I did a lot of work together as governor, so it's good to, to finally make it here. The, the short answer is it's very mixed. Mm -hmm. And I get to visit schools all over the nation, been to all 50 states, on a bus tour now, going through seven states in five days. And I see things that are both unbelievably inspiring and make me very hopeful. Um, I also visit places that, that frankly break your heart. Mm -hmm. And so for me, the challenge is always how do we get better faster? Mm -hmm. How do we help the kids in communities that often have been educationally underserved for decades have a chance in life? I think we all know that the stakes have, have, have gotten so much higher that I'm not that that old, but when, when I was growing up in the south side of Chicago, it uh, wasn't fantastic, but if some of my friends dropped out of high school, that wasn't the end of the world. They could go work in the stockyards and steel mills there and get a pretty good job and own a home and support a family. Um, today, if you drop out of high school, you're basically condemned to poverty and social failure. There are no good jobs out there in the legal economy. So we have high school graduation rates to all-time highs, which is fantastic, about 81%. But I think a lot about that 19 20%. And our society can't allow that talent potential to be on the sidelines and to frankly be a drag. So, we're making progress, but it's never fast enough for me. And I think we all feel a real sense of urgency because our kids have one chance to get a good education. Yeah. Uh, you'll be remembered, you're already known um, by anyone paying attention for your courage, the uh, uh, forcefulness with which you have uh, called the nation to account and, uh, on, uh, for its educational shortcomings and proposed constructive uh, measures that might improve this situation. When you look back now over uh, close to seven years uh, of tenure, which of your initiatives um, and, uh, and policies do you think have worked the best? And then which are you um, most dis disappointed or frustrated about in, term, uh, in terms of slower progress? Well, I, I given all, on all these things, I give us a, an incomplete grade because <laughs> none of these are where we ne need to be. So. I think the most important investment we can make as a nation is in high quality early childhood education. There's nothing more important than getting our babies off to a good start in life. So I'll give you both sides. I'm very proud that we've invested more than a billion dollars in states that want to increase access to high quality learning opportunities. I'm thrilled that this has become a truly bipartisan issue in the real world. We have Democratic and Republican governors investing, which historically didn't happen to increase access but there's still extraordinary unmet need. Tens of thousands of kids in many states that I visit don't have access. And the fact that we allow so many of our babies to start kindergarten a year to a year and a half behind is just crazy to me. And other countries don't do this. Other countries, it's sort of universal access. And the fact that we don't value those early childhood years enough uh, is, is heartbreaking. So we've struggled to get more of our friends in Congress to help make this a national issue. So that's on that one. On the K-12 side, Lots of really hard work going on. Many states struggling to raise standards, which is the right thing, to assess those standards in different ways, find better ways to support and evaluate teachers and principals. 
but it's a choppy, difficult time. It's a time of transition. The past year or two have been hard. The next year or two are going to be hard. As a nation, I think we're going to move to a much better place. Again, love that graduation rates are record highs, um, but still our dropout rate is unacceptably high. And then finally, uh, our goal is to lead the world in college graduation rates. And it's interesting. One generation ago, we did. Uh, today, we're about 12th. That's not something I think we should be proud of. And it's not that we've dropped. We've flatlined, and about 11 other countries have passed us by. So all of these things are building blocks. And I think our collective goal should be to have the best educated population, best educated workforce in the world. And um, we are not near where we need to be. Let me ask you about a couple of specifics uh, with which you've been associated. There, there are many, uh, but just to pick out two. You've been very forceful in calling for the um, closure of schools that are failing uh, year after year after year. Uh, are we getting anywhere? It's always hard to yeah. do. And to be clear, it's not even looking for closure necessarily. We are looking for change, for transformation. And I'll just give you one anecdote. Well, it's a couple things. Um, the fact that graduation rates are up, the fact that dropout rates are down, that's an indication things are going the right way. Um, race at the top has gotten most of the press and attention. We can talk about that. We've invested $4 billion there. What folks may not know is we've invested $5 billion, a billion more in our school turnaround efforts to take those chronically low-performing schools. And to be clear, we're talking about the bottom 5% of schools in states and districts. So not the 19 out of 20, but that bottom 1 out of 20 where it simply hasn't worked. Just one quick anecdote of why this is so important to me is uh, when I was leading the Chicago Public Schools, we were each year turning around, transforming, occasionally closing, but would always reopen something else. Uh, schools, and there's one high school, uh, Englewood High School in the heart of an African American community in the South Side that we were turning around. And a guy came to me, out, his name is Don Stewart, who uh, went on to go to be president of Spelman College, he was president of Chicago Community Trust, he was president of College Board, he said, Arnie, you're not going to believe this, but 50 years ago, I was supposed to go to Englewood High School. <laughs> and my mother wouldn't let me go because it was such a bad school. And he said, we were taking all kinds of grief in the community and lots of pushback. And he said, I'm so glad you have finally done something. And it just stopped me because it made me think, over those 50 years, how many Don Stewart's did we lose because that school at that time had like 6% of kids reading at grade level and like half the kids were dropping out. And for me, it's not just about trying to help those children and their families, although that's a big part of it. These are communities that have been devastated by lack of educational opportunity. And if we want to have strong, vibrant communities and stronger families, we have to have great schools. We have to have high expectations. One more quick note, it was in uh, Des Moines, Iowa, on, on Monday, the start of the bus tour with the president. We're at one of these schools that's being turned around, North High School. And a couple years ago, they had two AP classes and today they have 15. I'm a huge fan of advanced placement and having more high school kids get college credit. And while that progress is fantastic, it's great to go to two, from 2 to 15, what I said to the audience there is the children today at North High School aren't seven times as smart as they were four years ago. They just have seven times the opportunity, different expectations and different culture around success and different beliefs about what poor and minority kids can do in terms of take college classes. That's the kind of transformation that we're looking for. One more, um, and that is uh, charter schools. You've been a, an advocate, a practitioner in your Chicago days and other places. Um, however many years we are into that movement, a lot of still debate still out there. What's your, what's your assessment of the contribution they are or are not making? Yeah. I'm just very, very pragmatic and non-ideological. So I am pro-good charter schools. I am anti-bad charter schools. I am pro-good traditional schools. I am anti-bad traditional schools. And again, I just go back to those basic questions. Are high school graduation rates going up or not? Are more high school graduates truly college career ready? Are dropout rates going down? So there are extraordinary charter schools that, again, in some of these underserved communities for decades, that are seeing 95% graduation rates and 95% of their graduates go on to college. They are literally changing kids' lives. Mm -hmm. um, there are other charter schools that are in that bottom 5% around the nation that should be closed and, and you know, shut down. So it's a, it's a mix out there. And again, I think, I think all of us, we can sort of fight the adult battles we can think about what's good for kids. And I always say a, a seven-year-old or eight-year-old, they don't know or frankly care if they go to a charter school or a traditional school or you know, this school or that school. You know, is my teacher teaching me? Am I safe? Am I cared about? Is the principal in my corner? We need a lot more schools like that. 
So we fund good charters to replicate and we help them grow. And I've also challenged the charter school community. There's nothing sacred about the brand charter and actually bad charters hurt the brand and they should be very proactive in seeing the bad charter schools go away. Well, they are easier to close than traditional other public schools. Yeah. And, but the, that's, that's not the same as saying people finally do pull that trigger. Uh, lift my spirits about something, if you, if you would. Um, after all the effort and all the uh, uh, commitment and dollars, uh, we can still read all the time about school districts, large, usually large urban districts, uh, Baltimore, Philadelphia, Chicago, uh, Boston, per pupil expenditures, 15, 16, 17, 20 thousand dollars or more. Pick your metric. Eighth grade reading, um, 20, 15, 12. In Detroit, nine percent. Uh, are we going to? Are, are we forced to accept that there are some communities where the problems cannot be solved by the best educators and the best, uh, all the best efforts that we try to make? Yeah. So I don't agree with that at all. And for all the very real challenges that you articulate and that many of us see every day, I'm actually wildly optimistic and wildly hopeful. And again, I'm always looking oh, at- Oh, great. That's the answer <laughs> I was hoping for. Yeah. And, and it's, again, I, I have the luxury, I probably visit more, more schools in more parts of the country than yeah. anybody. So I think I have a, not a perfect, but a pretty good perspective of what's going on out there. And I'm always looking at growth and progress and who's improving, not just absolute results. Mm -hmm. And I look at other urban areas, you know, places like D.C. that were absolutely dysfunctional and corrupt, uh, places like New Orleans that had massive struggles, and you're seeing very rapid improvement. Now, is this mission accomplished? No. Do they have a long way to go? Absolutely. But many of these urban areas are actually improving faster than the states in which they live. Mm -hmm. And they're dealing with much more difficult social problems. They're dealing with much higher levels of poverty. When I ran the Chicago Public Schools, 85% of my students were minority, 90% lived below the poverty line, and we were trying to get better faster than the rest of the state of Illinois. So we are getting, there are many places that are getting better faster. The question to your point is how do we accelerate the pace of change? Mm -hmm. And not to, you know, just to take one second on it, there's no simple answer, but where you're seeing this rapid improvement, there are a couple pretty fundamental things that many of them are doing. First, there's a huge focus on early childhood education. I keep coming back to that. We have to stop playing catch up. And they're starting to have their kindergartners enter kindergarten ready to be successful. That's a big deal. There's a huge focus on attracting and retaining great teachers and principals, and nothing's more important. We have to be so much more creative about putting incentives in place to have that great talent come to our underserved communities, be that inner city urban or rural or remote or on tribal, tribal reservations. Um, there's a focus on wraparound services and after-school programming and helping families and making those schools truly community centers. There's a huge focus on rigor, more AP classes, more advanced placement, more IB, more dual enrollment. Um, and there's a very intentional uh, look at their results each year and a nimbleness and a humility that you have to make constant improvements. But where you see districts that are getting better fast, they're doing some combination of that in really, really thoughtful ways. And again, the progress has been, been really fun to watch. Switch to higher ed then for a little bit, and I'd remind everybody that uh, uh, the mics will be yours here in just a couple of few, or a few minutes. Um, it's a timely trip. You, you and the department just released uh, a new scorecard plus some liberalization of the uh, uh, financial aid rules that a lot of folks have been calling for for a while. I, I'd like to uh, say I have at least one school. We think these are really good steps forward. I, I know they haven't been universally uh, acclaimed yet uh, by the rest of higher, by everyone in higher ed, but um, uh, thank you for the uh, initiative on, on both fronts. Will you want to say a little a word or two about those uh, uh, improvements? Sure. We're, obviously, we always think about the sort of cradle through college and on to career, so a lot that we're trying to see happen, but on higher ed, we have to continue to make college more affordable, and again, love that what you've done here to keep tuition down and fixed. Um, if you poll the American public, lots of the American public is starting to think that college is for rich folks. It's not for folks like them. That's deeply troubling, deeply disturbing. So how we make college more affordable, um, so more financial aid, having states reinvest, making the financial aid form simpler, the fact that the FAFSA form, 
the financial form is so hard and complex, it's crazy. Mm -hmm. And so we've, we've tried to cut out a whole bunch of questions. We have it down to about 20 minutes. And if families can fill it out, that unlocks the key to $150 billion in grants and loans and stuff we did to use prior income taxes, hopefully make that the next step easier. We need to keep, uh, keep going there. So we have to focus on access. We have to focus on affordability. And the big thing we're pushing is we have to focus on outcomes. Mm -hmm. And are we graduating more students? Are we graduating more first-generation college goers and Pell Grant recipients? So we're trying to put out masses of amount of information and transparency to help young people and their families make better choices. Um, I think it's navigating college and grants versus loans and one-year costs versus four-year costs. It's too hard. It's too complex. It's daunting. If you have your parents have a college degree and if you're new to the country or English language learner, it, it's almost impossible. So whatever we can do to provide more transparency, more accountability, more information, make forms simpler, and help young people figure out the right school for them and for their unique circumstances, not where I tell them to go or you tell them to go, but the right fit for them, um, hopefully we'll see better completion rates and hopefully we'll incentivize the kinds of behavior among other universities, the leadership that you're providing, not just in cost, but in competency-based education and other things, I think, is exactly where higher ed needs to go. And the new uh, scorecard will uh, make more visible, more information more visible to more students and families, and that, I, I just think that's... Uh, inarguably a good idea, and thank you uh, for doing it. It's, it's different than a rating system, which at one point the department looked at, which is a, talk about a daunting challenge. <laughs> I, I guess you decided at least not for now. Yeah, yeah well, it's interesting. You just think about should the federal government put its seal of approval once a year on X set of metrics, or is the world changed and folks can draw their own conclusions and have this change on a daily, if not minute by minute basis, and sort of open this up to public and sort of crowdsourcing all those ideas. And the more we thought about it, the more we thought it'd be pretty arrogant for us to try and do one thing once a year and be static, rather than just get this stuff out and let folks figure it out themselves. And so I think it's a different sort of notion of what government can do, but this idea of transparency and, uh, and, and openness, um, I think there's real power there, and frankly a lot more power than us trying to do it by ourselves. So I think we got to the, I feel really good about where we got to, and we'll keep doing more of this going forward. Um, you you meant, just mentioned uh, uh, in passing competency-based education. You also, and, and, and Ted Mitchell, your terrific undersecretary, have been uh, uh, out uh, uh, promoting and, uh, and uh, encouraging uh, innovations of various kinds that would, would move us away from the, uh, not just the agricultural calendar, but the modes of instruction that have been uh, more or less unchanged for so very long. Um, we're we're interested here, but uh, are you seeing a lot of? Uh, inc uh, are you seeing encouraging trends elsewhere? We're seeing movement. Um, not again, it's never enough or fast enough. So appreciate the leadership so much. And again, just sort of step back. Whether it's higher ed or K to 12, this move from what we're all doing now is just a bad example from seat time <laughs> to competency. Um, I just think is the right thing to do. Mm -hmm. And whether it's an advanced physics class here or engineering, or whether it's algebra as a ninth grader, eighth grader, or seventh grader, if you can demonstrate that you know algebra, why should you sit in that chair for nine months? If you can demonstrate that you know biology or any other subject, um, why should you be stuck in a chair? And this idea of having folks learn at their own pace and let some folks who can fly, fly and go much faster, and folks who need more time, that's okay too. Give them the time to do that. And what's been fixed in higher ed and in you know, high school and middle school is time and seat time. And we want that variable to be the one that's actually flexible rather than fixed. And one way of looking at it I, and thinking about it, it seems to me, is whether we uh, can commit that our uh, educational systems at all levels will be built around the student around the system itself and the convenience of the people who operate it. I, I think, again, historically, you taught to a lecture hall of 500 or K-12, to a class of 25 or 30, and you sort of taught to the middle. And that had some strengths and I'd say lots of weaknesses. And the question now is how can we all individualize and personalize education? Mm -hmm. And this idea of a teacher, you know, differentiating instruction, <clears throat> the idea of folks learning at their own pace, at their own time for what works for them, People have very different learning styles, very different skills. People have very different life situations. And the, 
The traditional college student is now the non-traditional college student. So many are working, so many have families, so many have other pressures and challenges. And to try and make them conform to a traditional academic or agrarian calendar makes no sense. And how we are more flexible, how we help people, not just you know, K through 12 or higher ed, but for the rest of their lives. All of us have to be lifelong learners. How do we create those opportunities where you and others and other institutions like Purdue can provide leadership on that? That's a really, really big deal. One of the most exciting, gratifying moments that, that I've experienced here in three years was when we got the word that the department had, uh, had uh, chosen Purdue for one of your first in the world grants, and which goes right to this. Uh, that's our assignment under the award is to try to uh, innovate uh, in uh, uh, pedagogy here. And um, we're close to 200 courses now that have been transformed in part or, or entirely away from the old model and into various uh, forms that uh, incorporate online learning or uh, more, as they say, active learning methods. So uh, we, we know we'll make some mistakes, but we hope we learn enough that you can then share it with yeah. everyone else. Well, I'm sure you will make mistakes, and we welcome that. Mm -hmm. if, you, if, you know, if this was easy, uh, we wouldn't be funding it. But we think all the time about, I'm sure you did too as a governor when you were in the White House, of what's the appropriate role of the federal government? For me, what's the appropriate role of the education department? Mm -hmm. Lots of debate about, around that. But I think the more we can foster innovation and support creativity and let folks like you get out ahead of the rest of the nation and make some mistakes and learn but help to drive that, I think that's a really appropriate use of our resources and the federal government's role in education. So whether in the higher ed side or K-12, to we're trying to do the same thing and really help folks lead the nation uh, where I think we need to go. Okay. We've got it. One bold soul over here, I believe, on the, on the uh, right aisle. Thank you, and please, your question, please. <clears throat> Let's see. Is this turned on? Ah, beautiful. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Carrie Sapalo. Oh, could you please? Thank you. All right, and um, thank you. Uh, I graduated from Purdue in 1999, so yes, that means I'm old. But um, being totally blind, I received lots of Braille and tactile graphics support as a student here back in the 90s of which I'm forever grateful for. And I've gone off and got my PhD in chemistry and become a successful scientist, and I'm working back at Purdue in the chemistry department. And that being said, um, the matter of Braille literacy and fluency in Braille as it pertains to science and math is of deep concern to me. And Mr. Secretary, you may or may not be aware that the Braille Authority of North America recently adopted a new Braille reading system for the blind in the United States called the Unified English Braille System, which is great for literary Braille. However, it underserves blind and visually impaired children that wish to pursue math and science as a career. And further, um, once this adoption by BANA has occurred, there has been a decentralization of the Braille math system that's going to be used from state to state. The system that I utilize is something called the Nemeth Code for Math and Scientific Notation. And that's been around for over half a century. It was created by Abraham Nemeth, who was a, himself a blind mathematician. And hence, he incorporated lots of mathematical theory and equation structure into the code, communicating visual information to me as a blind Braille reader. But unfortunately, <clears throat> the new Braille system no longer factors in many of those conventions. And in many ways, it's, it requires more Braille cells to be used. So hence, it's more convoluted. And the Braille Authority of North America has recently taken the position that it's not their role to mandate that the states use one math reading system. So therefore, I'm deeply concerned because now we're going to have, starting in 2016 when the new system goes into effect, blind children studying in Indiana might be using the old Nemeth code system and blind children in Illinois that are using the new Unified English Braille math system. There's no standardization of Braille code. And when students and families move from state to state, they might have to switch code, further discouraging their interest in math and science. Thank you. That's a, let's give the secretary a sure. chance to, to, re, to respond. It's a, it's a, yeah, it's a complicated question. I don't have an easy answer. It's something we, we can continue offline. Um, the question I always think is sort of what's our, again, what's our role at the federal level here to, uh, what can we do? Um, our ability or even willingness to say you have to have one unified way to do things um, that doesn't work well, we'll figure it out <laughs> uh, when we do that. Whether we can provide incentives to you and other scientists to think about better ways to do this and create options, 
uh, for states or for students who you think might be underserved, where we can help in the innovation space, that's maybe a place that we can play. Uh, Michael Uden runs this office for us. We'd love to sort of set up a separate conversation to, to, uh, to continue it. So thank you for an interesting much. question. The good news is you've inspired an astonishing number of people to come <laughs> forward. The, the bad news is it, uh, if, if, you can't, if, if you all uh, could, uh, cannot keep these questions very brief, we're, we don't have a prayer of getting through them. So Ted, so short, short questions, I'll try to get some, short answers. Show, show some leadership. Uh, Secretary Duncan, Ted Malone, the Financial Aid Office. I just wanted to thank you and uh, echo President Daniels that we believe that the use of the prior prior year in the FAFSA is going to revolutionize our ability to serve students, especially low-income students. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, and Ted. just quickly, keep mm. pushing us. This is an important step in the right direction. It doesn't, as you know, entirely solve the challenge of underrepresented kids and communities thinking they can go to college. So other things we should be doing Please push us hard. Over here. Hi, uh, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Chinmay Jubilekar. I'm a PhD student in biological engineering. And my question is, what was the day like when you were appointed Secretary of Education? So sort of like a personal perspective. What was the day like when you were appointed? When and is it, is it like, do you know a priori? Or like, how, how is the process? Can you give us some perspective? So what was the day like when I was a, appointed? Or like when, so when did you first, like when you knew that, okay, I'm appointed as a secretary, then what was your reaction? Can you share some yeah. experience? Uh, <laughs> sure, no I'll, profanity allowed yeah, here. No, 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 no. <laughs> no I'll, I'll, I'll try and be brief. Um, to be very clear, my, my goal and aspiration was not to be secretary of education. I think when I was in college, I didn't know if the job existed. Um, I loved Chicago. I was leading the Chicago public schools. My goal was to do that for 10 years because there's so much instability in those jobs. And it had been uh, seven and a half years. So honestly, um, I was not jumping at the opportunity. What for me was just so unique is someone who was a, a close friend and someone who I deeply respected and worked for became president named Barack Obama. And it's not too many times in life your friend becomes president. It's sort of crazy. <laughs> and uh, so to be clear, I didn't come for the job or the title or the position. I came because I really, really believed in him. And to have a chance to be part of his team was this you know, life-transforming opportunity. So um, at the end of the day, it was a very short conversation with my wife and family. It was just the right thing to do. I um, feel so lucky to have had the chance. And honestly, some days you still pinch yourself. It's a little, a little crazy. And I come from a, you know, my mother ran an inner city tutoring program in South Side Chicago at 46 and Greenwood and to try and take her lessons from working out of a ch church basement there and where I learned all my life to try and have some impact at a national scale and build upon her life's work. Um, at a personal level, I can't tell you how meaningful it's been. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Secretary, Mr. President. Uh, I'm Lyle Janney. My job here at Purdue is the student portal, my Purdue. Um, in response to President Daniel's question with regard to, um, uh, uh, sorry, the, the learning, uh, uh, <sighs> Competency, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. competency-based learning. Sorry, brain, brain freeze there. Um, your responses were really mindful to me of the educational system in Finland, where uh, it's fully accessible, no standardized testing, uh, tailored for the students, etc. Um, and and I mean, it sounds like we we finally learned from from other nations in this regard, and and we're implementing steps to to activate some of that. So I want to ask you, uh, what's our roadmap for finally eliminating high stakes standardized testing? What? <laughs> I, I think you're blending two things that I might not totally agree with, so I'll try and, uh, try and unpack it. So to be very clear, if you're moving towards competency-based education, you have to assess whether folks are actually learning something or not. And so I don't know how to assess other than having an assessment. And we can debate what that assessment should look like. Um, but I just can't, I love Governor Daniels, I just can't take his word that folks who are taking these classes have the skills they need to be successful in the workplace. So I think, uh, just to, to go directly to your question, there are some places that are doing too much testing. And we've, I've talked about that, the President's talked about that. As we try and fix No Child Left Behind, we'd love to see a cap on testing. We want to remove redundancy and other things. But I think we also have to have an honest assessment of kids' ability, not just in college taking these classes, but in third and fourth and fifth and sixth grade and all the way up. And I think there's a common sense middle ground 
where you're assessing those skills and letting students know whether they're on track to be successful or not, you can do that without having too much time taking tests or teaching to the test or having duplicate or redundant tests. So to walk away from assessment, that's one end. I'm never going to support that. Folks where there's way too much time and energy and attention on a test, I'm not going to support that either. I do think there's a middle ground and we need to get there. But to be clear, as we move towards competency-based, that is not, in my mind, going to eliminate the need for assessment. In fact, it probably makes it more important. Over here. Um, thank you, Tim. <laughs> Thank you, Secretary, for uh, coming here. It's truly an honor to hear you speak. Um, Horizons is the largest TRIO program in the state of Indiana. Uh, there's a handful of us around here. Um, Horizons, to me, has offered so many opportunities for leadership. I am currently in a class where I mentor a handful of other Horizons students, and I was able to take a pretty uh, cost-effective study abroad course, which I wouldn't have been, would not have been able to go to otherwise. So I just want to thank you for continuing the funding TRIO, and that's all. Thank you. Thanks, and there are fantastic programs like TRIO and Upward Bound that help students you know, be prepared for college and be successful. I think it's just really important, too, that folks understand, the TRIO community understand that that's critically important. In my mind, funding high-quality early childhood education is also critically important, and we need to not be pitting these things against each other, but challenging folks in Congress to see education as an investment and not a blank check. We have to be getting results. We have to hold ourselves accountable. But we're very concerned, to be clear, with the current Congress that many of these education uh, agenda that we're trying to push, whether it's more college going, college success, or early childhood, many of these things are going to be defunded or cut significantly. And that's a huge concern to me right now. Dr. Sanders, welcome, David. Thank you. First, a comment. If we all, as we, I think we virtually all do, believe that active learning is a advantageous approach, it's going to require more resources and smaller classes. And we aren't always heading in that direction, so that's just the comment. The question is that for-profit colleges are a carbuncle on the body of higher education. <laughs> and yeah, I'll, 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 I'll hold myself back. So. <laughs> How are we going to overcome the political opposition to dealing with them, with cutting off their access to federal funds, to their being the modern corporate welfare queens that are bleeding the higher education budget? Um, so let me take the that two. Was, <laughs> that was the restrained version of the question. <laughs> So let me just take the resource question broadly. And again, for me, it's not Republican, Democrat, liberal, conservative, and Governor and I are of different parties and you know, slightly different beliefs on these different things. But we need, I think, more politicians at every level, local, state, and federal, who see education as an investment, not as an expense, and as the best investment we can make. And again, not a blank check. We have to have results. But that's the conversation we need to have. Just one quick plug. We got a couple dozen folks running for president right now, and I wish he was running for president, he's not. Um, but we should be asking them, are they willing to invest in early childhood education or not? Are they willing to, what's their goal for increasing high school graduation rates? What's their goal for leading the world in college graduation rates? And we let politicians give us sound bites. No one runs as the anti-education you know, governor or president or congressman or mayor. They all love to kiss babies, but very few walk the walk. And I don't blame them, I blame us. So if we want more resources for schools and for after school programming for early childhood, we have to demand that across the political spectrum. And we don't. We don't vote on these issues. And I think our kids and our nation pay a real price for that. So I challenge all of us on that. Um, on the for-profits, to be clear, I am not, again, like I'm not anti-for or you know, whatever, I'm not anti all for-profits. There are some for-profits that folks are gaining real skills that lead to higher paying jobs. And we hope they serve more students and do well. The fact of the matter is we have many, far too many bad actor for-profits who are taking taxpayer money, taking your and my money, and leaving disadvantaged folks in a worse position than when they started. And that is absolutely unethical, immoral, and we have to challenge that every single day. So we've had some major victories lately, which you've probably seen. Um, we have still far too many bad actors out there. And um, I will say, I talked to a reporter earlier today, one of our toughest battles was trying to get our gainful employment regulations passed. We spent 
a crazy amount of time on this. And candidly, the pushback was from Republicans and Democrats who had been bought off with our taxpayer dollars to fight us on this. So we've had some huge victories in court recently that opened that door. It's one of the toughest fights we've had. It should not have been that hard. But just know we're going to continue to fight it, not to eliminate for-profits, but to eliminate bad actors. Over here. Well, good afternoon, and thank you, um, Mr. Secretary, for coming, uh, President Daniels, uh, Representative Klinker. Um, I represent uh, uh, industry here in Lafayette. I'm with uh, Cutting Edge Industrial Technologies. My name's Paul DeFabio, and we just hired three Purdue engineering grads in, uh, in May. Um, so I'm friendly. <laughs> but I have a question, and that is, uh, last month, Lafayette was named the number one, one of the number one cities in the country for its size in high-tech manufacturing. Uh, and with the advent of uh, President Daniel's Polytechnic School, and somewhere between 600 to 2 million to 3 million empty jobs, manufacturing jobs. Um, what's, what's the road that, that you see that we should travel here? We, we have an excellent opportunity, um, and, and I'm, I'm just curious. You know, these, these are all great questions, so I can't tell you how many CEOs I've met with and the president has met with that in tough economic times, with unemployment being higher than we would like, who say we are trying to hire right now and we can't find the employees with the skills we need to hire. And that disconnect, it just it, it drives you crazy. So there's no, and, and many are in the STEM fields, not all, but many in the STEM fields. So uh, you have to look at this sort of comprehensively. We've put a huge amount of money through the Department of Labor behind community colleges to build partnerships with industry. Uh, $2 billion so that real training leads to real jobs. Um, that's a piece of it. We've put a couple hundred million dollars behind high schools to redesign and to focus more on these areas. And again, to be very clear, this is never STEM or STEAM versus the liberal arts. We need more of both, but we know so many of the high paying jobs are in these, are in these areas. Um, I love the fact that the university is going to start to uh, run a school that will help more students from the minority community be successful. I don't know this, but I bet the three folks you hired who are graduates were white. Uh, actually, one. one was white. I'm wrong. I'm happy to be wrong on that. <laughs> so that's, that's very encouraging. But we need to make sure that, again, underrepresented communities and families have access to this kind of stuff. So how do we build those pipelines? The final thing I'll say it goes down to how do we get more STEM teachers in second and third and fourth grade? who love the STEM fields and are comfortable and confident, because that's when we lose so many kids. So no simple answer, but we need a better pipeline of teachers. We need to think differently about how we're teaching in high schools. We need to continue to fund higher ed and community colleges to build real partnerships. And it's both a crazy challenge, but also, to your point, an amazing opportunity. And if we can keep those good jobs in this country and have more folks have access to them, everybody wins here. Sure. Thank you for the pen. <laughs> for you. Did I do that? No, they're giving pens out from the oh, Department okay. of Education. <laughs> yeah. oh, oh, oh. My, my team's smarter than I am. I didn't even know we were doing it. Yeah. I just want to know why Paul only hired three. <laughs> <laughs> you need, you need, we, we need you to make more money, Paul, so you'll hire. Next year we want five. Um, good afternoon, Mr. President, Mr. Secretary. Um, my name's Abigail Johnson. I'm a junior in the Psychological Sciences program. Um, and I've always kind of had an odd passion for um, educational policy. Both of my parents are educators. Um, my father has a background in the Head Start program and then is now actually um, a business law teacher at a charter school in um, downtown Gary, Indiana. So, um, and to be perfectly frank, sir, I think I do want your job someday. <laughs> you, you can have it. I'm just keeping the seat warm. <laughs> um, so I was just curious, you know, as I'm still in my undergrad and for anybody who might um, also want to get extremely involved in educational policy in the future, what um, some suggested next steps would be? That's a great question. I wouldn't call it an odd passion. I call it a great passion. And, uh, <laughs> And sometimes I'm the wrong guy to give advice on this because, again, candidly, this was not my life's ambition or career or whatever. What I will s You were going to start for the Celtics, weren't you? That, that was in, <laughs> one good enough. These got people, sent, these got people may not skill. know that you were drafted and uh, you had a, a, a pro career out, outside the country. And for outside, a while. outside the world, they sent yeah. me to, but it was lucky, amazing, amazing chance. 
But just a couple quick things, whether it's education or something else. For me, it's always following your passion and figure out, I've loved two things in my life. I've loved basketball and I've loved education. And I played basketball for four years and for the past 25 I've done education. And lots of my friends from high school have been more financially successful than I've been, but I wouldn't trade places. And I think to have the impact and do something that you would do every single day for no money. So find your passion, whatever that is, and do it. Secondly, it's important, particularly on the you know, education side, you need policy, you need people doing the real work with kids. Mm -hmm. So I've spent a lot of time working hands-on with kids. Um, I worked for a city public school system. I ran a public school system. I didn't have experience at the state level. So that's the one thing that would have been good for me, and now I've had experience at the federal level. And so it's good to have a cross-section of those. If you're a policy whiz, but don't understand the impact on the classroom, mm -hmm. um, you're, you're, you're wasting your own time and wasting other folks. We need folks who can bridge those two worlds, who know what it's like to teach in Gary, Indiana, as you do, and to think about what policies will help kids and teachers in that environment be successful. So follow your passion. Think about working at different levels, policy, practice, local, state, fe uh, federal. And the big thing for me is I've just been so lucky to always work for good people. And so finding people, regardless of the job or title or position or salary, find really smart people who are going to help you grow. That's probably the most important thing you can do. It, if I'm counting correctly, we have 14 people in 13 minutes, so uh, I'll remind every, uh, the questioners of the, of the value of brevity, please. Um, so my question is brief, uh, but it's two parts. First is uh, that there's a movement to link uh, student test scores to teacher assessment as far as like the teacher will be paid based on their teacher's test scores, although we keep their jobs based on the teacher's test score or the student's test scores. So my first question is what your thoughts on the, are, what your thoughts are on that? And the second is, with that in mind, how are you attracting um, experienced and high quality teachers to lower performing schools, especially in the inner city? Yeah, two, two, great, two great questions. So I think, again, it's very important to have the facts here that a piece of teacher evaluation, we never say the whole thing, but as a piece of teacher evaluation, student learning needs to be a part of that. And there are different ways to assess student learning. We can have a long debate about the different ways to do that. But what, the question is, like, what are we fighting against? And what I'm fighting against is a system that historically across the country for decades, teacher evaluation and student learning were divorced from each other. In fact, when we came to Washington, there were a set of states where it was against the law to link student learning and teacher evaluation. And I think the goal of great teaching is not to teach. The goal is to actually have your students learn. So let me just start with that. We can have that conversation. Secondly, I'm always interested, as I said earlier, not in absolute test scores or anything or absolute graduation rates, but in growth and gain, how much you're improving. And I can tell you from some of my toughest neighborhoods on the south and west side of Chicago, where you had amazing teachers seeing remarkable growth of students who weren't born with a silver spoon in their mouth. And I think if we want to elevate and strengthen teaching profession, we have to talk about those teachers who are transforming kids' lives and be willing to shine a spotlight. And no one goes into teaching to make a million dollars. Teachers are the most altruistic people ever. But compensation should be a, a, a piece of what we think about. And so I think we can debate the best way to do it, and it's hard and complex. But to say that teacher evaluation should be no part of, uh, of student, you know, student learning should be no part of teacher evaluation, and to say that a great teacher shouldn't make $150,000, a great principal shouldn't make $250,000, I think we should be paying teachers a heck of a lot more money. I think we should be paying them a heck of a lot more to go work in the inner city of Chicago or on a Native American reservation. And actually, our lack of courage in thinking differently about these things, I think, does kids a disservice. Last thing, I know what I'm telling you quickly, a place like DC, which has been dysfunctional for years, is getting better. A fantastic teacher who's 29, 30 years old in DC can make $100,000 a year now. It's pretty interesting. And uh, they're not having a problem attracting and retaining good teachers there. Thank you. Let's go over here. Thank you, sir. Uh, my name is Manas Taliarkin. I'm a grad student at Purdue Polytech. The United States has world-class colleges and universities, and yet our public school system is the way it is. How much of it do you think is attributed to how we as a society value professors versus how we value teachers? Never been asked that one before. I think of that. Um, I, I don't know if that's that's a, maybe a piece of the challenge. Um, I think our maybe what you're getting at 
For me, we have to just fundamentally elevate the teaching profession itself. I look at places like South Korea and Singapore that are you know, kicking our butt educationally, pardon my language, and teachers there are known as nation builders. Well, I think our teachers are nation builders too. I think our teachers are doing extraordinary things in under-resourced communities every single day. So how we attract, how we retain, how we compensate, how we support great, great talent to come into education, to come into the K-12 system, and again, I keep repeating myself, in underserved communities, in disadvantaged communities, and not just come for a little while but stay, um, I think we have to be much more radical, much more creative in, in how we do that. So for me, it's not a conflict of teachers versus professors. I hate these, you know, pit one versus another. I don't see that, but I do see a huge need to elevate the teaching profession itself. And if we do that, I think you see student achievement uh, skyrocket. Good afternoon, my name is Rakaya perkins Williams. I'm a first year doctoral student here at Purdue at Leadership and Policy. And my question is, the Washington State Supreme Court recently ruled publicly funded charter schools is unconstitutional. Um, what are your thoughts about this ruling and what do you think is gonna be the impact on charter schools moving forward um, nationally? Yeah, I don't know the details of what, whether it's unconstitutional or not. Um, as I said earlier, I think great charter schools are part of the solution. Bad charter schools are part of the problem. And uh, I think in Washington, they've not had a lot of, probably like six or eight charter schools. But uh, if those schools are helping kids learn who didn't have the opportunity before, if they're creating a, an option and a choice that, that didn't exist in the neighborhood, to deny kids and families that option doesn't quite make sense to me. And the one thing about charter schools, we could debate all the pros and cons, no one has ever assigned to a, char a charter school. You never have to go. And if they're not doing a good job, parents and kids vote with their feet, that school no longer exists. And again, for high-performing charter schools, you often have waiting lists of hundreds, if not thousands. And so the question is, what are we doing not just to replicate those, but what are we doing to learn the lessons from successful charter schools and taking them to other schools, be they traditional or charter? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Secretary, my name is Sean Carr. I'm a senior in political science here. Uh, my question is, you spent the beginning part of your talk talking about how you want to increase the number of students graduating high school. We're at like 80 percent, you were saying. But while we're increasing our output of students graduating high school, we're not necessarily increasing the quality of students that we are graduating. So my question is, what initiatives right now besides increasing AP and IB classes is the uh, Department of Education pursuing to implement in the next year or so? It's a great, great question, and, and it's really important. It's not so much what we're doing, but what states are doing. So the goal, to your point, is not just to graduate high school students. For me, the goal is to graduate them actually college and career ready. And for me, the simple test there is do they have to take remedial classes in college? And in many, many states, historically, those standards have been dummied down to make politicians look good. And we've been lying to kids and families for a long, long time, and it's absolutely insidious. So this is hard and controversial and pushed back from the far left and the far right for a whole host of regions. But the idea of having high standards, each state can do their own, call them what you want, doesn't matter. But if the goal is to not just graduate students, but to have them graduate able to take credit-bearing college classes, for me, that should be a non-political, common-sense goal. If we do that, then those diplomas actually mean something. Hi, my name is Sophie Longest. Um, I'm a freshman here studying English education. Um, and something disheartening and fascinating I've learned already in my first few weeks here is that many people don't consider teachers professionals because they don't write their own standards. And I guess my question is, why aren't teachers involved in writing what they teach in the classroom? Actually, so as states are working towards moving towards higher standards, teachers have been absolutely integral to that process. And so I think so much what we have to do is to empower teachers uh, to be creative, to have a joy for learning in the classroom. And so these aren't, again, these are false choices. And the move towards higher standards has been driven and teacher-led. And there are extraordinary teachers who are helping to challenge the status quo and do something better. And as hard as this is, the vast majority of states are going the right direction. And we would not be where we are today without the hard work and courage and leadership of teachers. Thank you. Mr. President, Mr. Secretary, uh, my name is Troy Bell. Let me start by saying thank you, uh, President Daniels, for the opportunity that I had to share a flight with you from uh, Atlanta to Indianapolis. Uh, 
And in large part because of that flight, your commercial air travel is such a privilege it was, anymore, Troy. But <laughs> it was in coach. Too. It was in coach. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for pointing that out. <laughs> yes. yes. <laughs> air Tran, actually. <laughs> so, um, but in large part due to the conversations that we had, I went on to pursue the opportunity to become a leader in a charter school management network. So we, I lead a network of 22 schools in eight states. They are all Title I schools. And in Gary, Indy, as well as in East Chicago, we have ranged from 97 to 100% graduation rates, as well as college acceptance rates. So uh, we're doing some good things. Um, but from my experience, I'm going to ask you two questions. From my experience, one of the, the uh, challenges that we run into is the lack of connectivity between um, uh, higher ed and K-12. What's going on in higher education and K-12? And I want to apl applaud you, President Daniels, for what you're doing to bridge that gap. So I'd like for you to talk a little bit about the idea of uh, higher ed becoming more involved with uh, K-12 education through their involvement with charter schools. And then the second question, a little bit different, uh, the reason why our schools are, are as, ex as successful as they are, in my opinion, is because we're addressing social problems. All of our schools have a clinic. We have, uh, in addition to health care, care, dental care, as well as uh, daycare. So we're showing that the correlation between healthy students and student performance. Thank you. <laughs> so my question along those lines mm -hmm. are, what uh, can your agency do to help incentivize more schools mm -hmm. to be able to address the social problems that are preventing or, or limiting student performance. So just quickly again, having higher education work with K-12, it's just so hugely important. And whether it's running your own school, whether it's your social work students going in, or your dental students going in, or your medical students going in, or tutoring, or mentoring, or coaching, um, we have to get out of our ivory towers. And whether it's running your own school or University of Chicago where I'm from that has a network of schools, many places starting to do this. John Hopkins is doing some really interesting stuff in Baltimore. Um, there's a growing awareness that this disconnect, this divide serves no one well. And so applaud the leadership here. We need to see that continue to happen. Not every university is going to run their own school or network. I'd love to see more of that. But you have amazing <laughs> undergrads and grads and faculty who could be doing all kinds of things in the real world. And don't forget, with all the challenges we talk about, you know, disconnect between professors and teachers, 99% of our nation's teachers are coming from your institutions. And so to somehow disown them or have that disconnect just simply doesn't make sense at all. You guys create, higher ed creates the K-12 infrastructure. So we have to be honest uh, about that. On, this, on the, uh, the, the ra I call it wraparound services, just so important. When we were in Chicago, we had a couple dozen schools that had healthcare clinics attached to them. Biggest thing I learned in my mother's program growing up, if kids were hungry, it's hard to concentrate. If they can't see the blackboard, it's hard to learn. If they're not safe, if they're scared, it's hard to focus. And so all of those things are not extra. They're foundational. They're fundamental. So we do a lot of funding of after-school programs. One of the things that came out of the Affordable Care Act, as people didn't know, is uh, not us, but HHS funded a couple hundred school-based health care clinics. And we want to continue to do all those things to make sure kids physically emotionally, socially, are safe and cared for so we can start to talk about algebra, trig, and biology. So you guys are doing things exactly the right way. Thank you. Thanks for the question, Troy, and for all you're doing. Hi, thank you. My name is Sean McCann. I'm the director of the Associate Accelerated Degree Program across the river at Ivy Tech Community College. We help get uh, first, uh, first generation and low income students a degree, 60 credit hour degree in 11 months. Very fast paced, very accelerated at, at a high success rate. Programs like the Horizons program, the Purdue Promise program, TRIO programs in general, um, like you said, uh, are not a blank check and we have to have results. Financial aid is a first step for these students, for these low income and first generation students. Getting them aid and access to higher education is the first step. The second step is keeping them here and, and having that opportunity to engage, to engage in the principles that, that incorporated with student success. How can we, as constituents, fight to keep programs like Student Success, Purdue Promise, TRIO, Horizons, and my program? In addition, what is the Department of Education doing to fight for that funding and main, make sure that that's maintained? So, so first, I'm just a big fan of Ivy Tech, and we've done a whole lot with them, and the creativity and the leadership has been fantastic. So love what you guys are doing. 
I would just say, again, I could care less, Republican, Democrat, I'm not political, we need people to vote along educational issues. And if you go back to the 2012 debates, it was very discouraging to me that education was like not a part of those debates. And I haven't seen much across the spectrum that's of much interest right now. So again, politicians reflect what we want them to reflect. And so I don't, pretty much, I don't blame them, I blame us. So at every level, sto state, local, now the presidential election coming up, are folks willing to support and invest in these things, or are they not? And if we don't insist upon it as voters, we get you know, what we put in. So that's on, that's on us to do those things. So we, for the third time, I'll remind everybody, quick, 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 please, so the secretary can stay on schedule. Well, hello, my name's Danae Rush. I'm a senior in health and physical education here on campus. And my question is actually about the health of our nation. In a nation where chronic disease is the number one killer of United States citizens, one in four children are considered obese and overweight. 80% of those will continue to be obese and overweight into adulthood, which leads to chronic disease. And yet we're cutting health and physical education at elementary levels, even at campus levels in case of Purdue where the program has been cut. So my question is, what are we doing to continue to fund those programs that are so vital to the health of our nation? So Unfortunately, lots of things have been cut that don't make sense. So PE gets cut, music gets cut, arts gets cut, social workers get cut, counselors get cut. And these things aren't, for me, extra or extracurricular. Mm -hmm. They are part of what keeps students healthy and engaged and in school and motivated to come to school every single day. And it simply goes down to investment. Just to be clear, quickly, on the funding K-12, funding from the federal level is usually 8 to 10%. And half is usually sort of state, and 40% is local. So this is really a local, much more local and state issue. We can help. We do some things. But these cuts are made you know, by boards and by superintendents, not because they want to, but because that's their fiscal or financial reality. So unless we are investing and investing wisely in education, um, untenable cuts happen. Untenable cuts get made. Final piece that is just continues to be, to me, very unfair, unfair and un-American as so much of K-12 education is funded on local property, tax pay, or local property tax base. So in Chicago, I had less than half the money for my students in wealthier suburbs just five miles north of us along Lake Michigan. And those kids were already coming with tremendous advantages to school that my kids didn't have. So it tells a nation we're willing to take on some of these just huge inequities and resources. Um, these aren't getting cut in affluent communities. These are getting cut in impoverished communities who need them the most, and it's a travesty. Uh, hello, Secretary Duncan. Uh, my name is Anand Balar, and I'm a sophomore here. I just have a real quick question. Uh, do you think that you'll ever win uh, MVP of the NBA Celebrity <laughs> All-Star Game? There's still hope. There's still hope. All right. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Mr. President, Mr. Secretary, my name is Caroline Shanley, and I am the Director of Federal Government Relations for Purdue Student Government. So I was just wondering if you had some ways that our students could voice their concerns or ideas to your department. Um, absolutely, and I'll give you my card when we're done. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. Well, that worked. <laughs> Hello, I'm Morgan. I'm studying, um, a senior studying English education here. I am observing a school that has been piloting a one-to-one -one program in a couple classrooms for several years. My question for you is, what else can these schools be doing or can your department be doing to help push the one-to-one -one initiative completely? Thanks for raising that. I should have, so I'm going to try to be very brief. For all the lack of investment we talked about in cutting programs and the challenge there, each year as a country, our 15,000 school districts spend eight to nine billion dollars a year on textbooks. And I would argue those textbooks are basically obsolete the day they show up in their classrooms. And so in tough economic times, this move from print to digital is a really big deal. And you have a relatively small number of school districts moving in this direction. Um, I was in Williams Field, Illinois, which is a town of 650 last night, and they stopped buying textbooks a couple years ago and are doing some extraordinary things. So this is a, where, again, we talked earlier, education, we in education aren't great at stopping doing things. We're good at doing new things. I think we need to stop buying textbooks. I think we should put all that money into digital. And we need to make sure we're supporting teachers in that transition and supporting students in the transition. And again, that's hard. And it's a tough change. Um, but the fact that we're buying books 
five, six, seven year cycle, social studies books that again are obsolete today, they show up in the classroom, makes no sense to me whatsoever. Thank you. And thanking you for your patience, you have the last question. Uh, uh, hi, Alan Friedman, Biological Sciences. Um, if the for-profit higher education model has been, let's say, largely a failure, um, there are some other innovations that are going on out there, like the Minerva Project. Do you have any idea what kinds of radical experiments you'd like to see tried in higher education? That's a great question. So we're, we're trying through our X sites to provide funding for folks who are doing stuff in this space. So I think the competency-based stuff is very important. I think the short-term training, if you can learn to code in four months and get a job paying $55,000, $60,000, and historically we couldn't do that because of you know, Carnegie News and stuff, um, we should be looking there. We're doing some things recently uh, to get Pell Grants to folks who are incarcerated. And that's pretty controversial, but I think it's absolutely the right thing to do if we want to reduce recidivism and have people come out of jail and be productive citizens. So I think these are all, these are all areas where we're trying to provide seed funding and space and flexibility. The big one that where we are still part of the problem is ultimately, for me, it's all about outcomes. And we do $150 billion in grants and loans each year. And it's all basically on inputs, on access. And access is important, but I don't want just access. I want completion. I want graduation rates. I want people walking across stages like this. And so we need to move some of our funding towards not just inputs, but to outcomes. And wherever those good outcomes are coming from, we should be agnostic. We should be wide open there. So thanking the audience for being here, and the questioners in particular, for a terrific set of uh, uh, topics for the secretary. I'll, I, uh, I was saving a, a, a question. He doesn't like to talk about himself anyway, so I'll convert it to a comment in the interest of time. Uh, if, you, if you hadn't reflected on this, here we have a person who has not only served in two of the most difficult, challenging, high-pressure uh, uh, occupations uh, one can imagine, heading the Chicago school system and then his present job. But please notice that he stuck with those assignments for an, an extraordinarily long period of time. These are jobs that either chew up and spit out their occupants, or in many cases are used as sort of a place where someone goes for a couple years, checks a resume box, and moves on, having made very little Im imprint. I just want to say how much I admire someone who has taken on these jobs and in so doing faced some of the most rigid uh, 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 difficult, well-funded, so often selfish special interests that we have in our whole society and has stuck with them for seven years in each case. It's an extraordinary commitment. And for that reason, Secretary Duncan, uh, I consider you one of the finest public servants of our day and Purdue's very, very honored you came and spent some time with us today. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you so much for the proper question. Thank you.